Gotcha. Hey, Glenn, how are you? Good, good, Sean. How you been, man? I've been uh, I've been doing okay. I'm uh, you know staying staying pretty busy. Uh, it's great to have you back. Uh, so I guess you you guys must be just cold going into the pretty cold season up there in the in the hills, of Idaho, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but Sean, we're in extreme denial right now. We've had a beautiful fall, and um, gosh, it's been like 70 and 60, but. Uh, I think this morning it was like 15 degrees. <laughs> there you go. We're kind of bumming. Yep. We're, we're in kind of hostile, like, denial right now. So, but it's yeah, going to be like, I had to get used to it. The cattle are already good to go. They're, they're totally into it. The horses are into it. But it's the humans that are having trouble coming along here. So, yeah, I had to, I had to scrape to, to get into my car yesterday morning was something I hadn't had to do for many 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 years what? I've been spoiled by living well I'm up I'm up in uh yeah I'm up in Washington state right now and so we moved oh, up no here kidding. a couple months ago so it was, oh, yeah. 20, it was 27 degrees so it was, it was pretty chilly my truck was frozen the doors were frozen closed and uh, I thought that was just kind of funny I hadn't had to deal with that in You're several kidding. decades you must be on the no, east side so, where, where are you Sean in Washington well, no I'm I'm on the west side. It was just a really cold morning. It's uh, I'm in I'm in a little town called Snohomish, which is uh, kind of uh, north north west of, northeast rather of Seattle by about thirty miles or so. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about agriculture. I suppose that'd be a, that'd be a pretty good topic. Um, awesome. Glenn, if you don't mind, can you give the folks that haven't uh, haven't met you before a little bit about your background? Sure. Sure. So. Um... I've been doing Alder Spring Ranch for almost 30 years. This is year 29 we're coming into right now. And my wife and I started it back in, uh, I guess it was, yeah, 92. And we bought seven cows and uh, we really had, we had a little bit of money in savings. I think it was 30 grand and we put it down on a small place and uh, kind of started everything from scratch. We really didn't know anything. Um, she and I both had a lot of background in conventional agriculture of all sorts. Um, she was raised on a corn and soybean farm in the Midwest. Um, I've worked there on corn, corn and soybeans in the Midwest as well. So I'm very familiar with row crop agriculture. Um, transitioned my agricultural kind of journey into forestry did that for about 15 years. And um, it was actually during that 15 year period that we, um, we bought this small ranch. And um, so it started out with those seven cows on 145 acres, central Idaho. And the reason it was, you know, Sean, we were just, you know, in forestry, I was working for the bureaucracy, you know, the, the government. And I felt like I was getting pulled further and further away from the land. We started to have a family. We wanted to kind of put it all together, kind of put together all the ecological background we had. My wife is a PhD plant ecologist. I was a forest ecologist. And we want to take that ecological background and apply it to, you know, what, what we previously experienced in agriculture. And uh, so we bought this ranch. And, you know, of course, uh, we we're young, had a few kids. We thought, hey, we can tackle this one and we can do it better than other people because we have all this great background. And it was the most humbling thing we'd ever done in our lives. And uh, <laughs> it was a little demoralizing for a while because it turns out we learned it was very, very difficult to, uh, to make money in agriculture, especially with no inherited equity in terms of, you know, cattle machinery or land. And um, so we got on that treadmill of trying to make it you know, with an ecological bent in conventional uh, cattle raising, and it just about killed us. It almost torched us, you know, in, in terms of, you know, economics. And if we didn't have, um, you know, jobs to subsidize our existence while we we're working full time on the ranch. Um, so we, <laughs> we were working full time on these jobs. Still, I was still practicing forestry. Carol was still doing ecological contracts. We were working together on some of those ecological contracts and we were working full time on the ranch. Um, we, we grew our mama cows pretty quick. We borrowed some money and ended up with about 250 mama cows that we started to calve. And um, especially in the winter, um, boy, it just was absolutely hosing us emotionally, um, psychologically, eco uh, <laughs> ecologically in terms of the human ecology, but um, economically, it was just kicking our butt. And um, so we started, we started a, uh, 
a niche market uh, raising grass-fed beef. Then we transitioned that into organic beef. And we started out by just processing one or two at a time every two months and selling them direct. And uh, boy, it was a rodeo to learn all that. And then we started selling online. And um, right about then, it, there was kind of a grass red revolution in the early 2000s. And um, we started to uh, we started to make the economics work. And um, we started to become at least profitable in the business sector. We we're still losing money on the ranch. But um, what was fascinating, Sean, was that the paradigm of raising grass-fed beef um, you know, we're going for a high quality product that, you know, I, I don't know how much your audience knows about grass fed beef, but a lot of it um, is, um, is pretty bad <laughs> that you see online. And it's because, um, you know, there, there's this leanness thing that's, uh, that's supposedly a given with grass fed beef. And Carol and I, we don't like lean meat. We used to eat a lot of wild game, a lot of, a lot of elk and deer that we shot. The reason we like beef was because we want to get away from that and get into a more marbled, um, you know, presentation, something that, you know, we could enjoy the fat yield of because we've always liked a nice fatty ribeye, right? So it's like, well, why can't we do that with grass fed beef? And it turns out that the paradigm um, that we had to get into with the finishing of quality grass fed beef that actually had marbling associated with it was also a paradigm that made our soils just take off and what i mean by that is that we we it wasn't like we had this like you know soil testing paradigm and all this stuff that we were learning from ourselves we didn't know anything about that sean we didn't know anything about the ground we were walking on but our cattle the way we we're managing them actually increased the value of those soils so dramatically that now um we we can count on growing double the amount of beef we used to be able to on the same amount of acres. We've uh, increased our average daily gain by a third to a third to um, you know half again as much on the same ground. And it's just because that soil biology has finally taken off. And now we're finally starting to understand it because we started doing soil testing. And I had um, I had a good friend of mine, Nicole Masters, actually spent time with us on the ranch last summer. And she taught us a lot about how to assay the, the value of those soils. So what's happened on this journey is that, sure, the, um, the web store and selling direct market beef pulled us into agricultural success. But it was like this team of horses called the web store pulling this wagon with no wheels called the ranch. And it was dragging it across the fields. But now we find that our ranch because of this soil thing is actually almost able to be self-propelled without the horses. So we could, Carol and I actually have kicked around getting back into the commodity market because we're profitable just because of the attribute of the land itself, as opposed to, you know, this attribute of direct marketing and relationship marketing. Uh, we thought, hey, wow, we could actually re-enter the commodity market and be profitable in the world of agriculture because our soils have regenerated to the point where they're actually carrying it now they're carrying her our whole operation and that's that's the exciting thing that's why i just want to you know grab my neighbors grab my friends who are practicing ranching and say you know what there's hope it's just that we've lost our way we've lost our way in these soils and we can provide a way better quality product in terms of health benefits because when you graze on these biologically rich soils, of course your the beef is going to be, you know, incredibly more uh, biologically resilient for the human genome as well. So that's that's kind of the that's the really long elevator pitch of the journey we're on, and it's it's getting more exciting by the day because I'm seeing hope not only for us in a direct market business, but there's hope for my neighbors, you know, who I look at out the window and they're just practicing this conventional juggernaut of chemical use of iron, of a lot of tillage. And um, Sean, almost all of them are losing money. They're, they're going under. And um, we have an agricultural crisis in this country. 
And it's because um, our agricultural practitioners are no longer profitable. Um, we're, they're losing ground. And I'm excited to say that there's hope. Uh, well, and that's good, good to hear. I gotta, let me ask you a question. When I was out uh, a few months ago in North Carolina on a ranch, and the rancher is a very big proponent of regenerative cell agriculture, but one of the things he was doing um, that was kind of unusual was he was laying down minerals uh, in, in, in these boxes, you know, these, these discrete boxes of potassium and sodium and, you know, cobalt and selenium and all these little minerals supplements for the cows to eat. And what he found was they would go in there and they would eat some for a while and then they would stop eating that one and they would eat, eat the other ones. And so it's kind of like, you know, they're, they're getting their minerals to what they need. They know what they need and they figure it out and it tastes good to them yeah. and then they don't do it anymore. But I think you, you're talking about the rich soils you have in Idaho there. Are you, you know, cause I know you've described how these cows kind of just kind of pick and choose through the different foods. Is that, is that something you think is happening? Are they getting minerals through that or what are they doing with, with that when they're, when the cows are, uh, you know, kind of, you know, kind of, you know, playing around what they want to eat. You know, one day they might want something, something the other day they want, may, may not want it or something like that. Have you, have you, I think you've observed that, haven't you? Yeah, I've totally observed that. Um, so it's, you know, we humans, um, I think we're capable of the same kind of choices. And it's basically choices based on what our palate is telling us. Um, and I think that, um, you know, initially when we got started on this regenerative road, you know, when, when we're dealing with deteriorated soils, um, we too were feeding those free choice minerals and allowing our, our animals to collect those. And, um, but what happened was that they stopped being interested in a lot of free choice minerals as our soils improved. And what we saw them then doing was actually uh, choosing grasses based on their palates, you know, different species of grass. So when we got this place, we moved on to this larger place in the Pissimurai Valley. Right now we're running on 2000 acres of deeded ground and about 46,000 acres of lease ground. So quite a bit bigger operation. We're running uh, those, those seven cows have turned into anywhere between uh, 550 and 750 head. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, when we got this place, um, the soils were very deteriorated and we had about an average, you know, on a given square meter of soil, Sean, you'd find five species of plants. And, you know, I knew the plants, Carol really knows the plants. So now I'm having a lot of difficulty because we did a plant count uh, just a month ago, just before it started freezing. So we could go out there and look at uh, green grass. So my wife and I looked at these plants and we collected a plant list. So what, what our plant list was when we moved on to the place, it was about 10 to 15 species. Um, now it's between 85 and 90. And so what we're seeing is that our cow wellness has dramatically improved. And I think it's attributable to the fact that they can eat based on their palates. They can truly balance based on their palates because they can now choose all these different types of plants. And I've talked to a friend of mine, Dr. Fred Provenza, maybe you've heard of him. He's written an excellent book called Nourishment. I have it on my shelf right here. Um, it just uh, really speaks to this whole aspect of, you know, creating our own wellness through nutrition by, um, by listening to our palate, by actually spending time investing in our palate. You know, we humans, you know, especially me, you know, I, I don't know what your food history is, Sean, but, you know, be, I've been carnivore now for almost three years, but prior to that, you know, especially in my adolescent years and in my 20s, you know, it was Pepsi Cola, Doritos, it was whatever, you know, just total junk food. And I think, you know, when you do that kind of eating, um, you really lose the ability to listen to a palate. Your palate is pretty much silenced by fake food. And you, you can't even discern anything about, you know, reality checks in terms of what your nutritional needs are uh, based on being able to look for the kind of food you need to eat. So, you know, what we found, it, it was kind of the same thing with our cows. They were basically eating Doritos because it was just, a, you know, Kentucky bluegrass, quackgrass, alfalfa. 
uh, clover, you know, just the basic, you know, four or five plants that can live on these naturalized pastures. And it's because they are the ones that can withstand the most abuse. You know, time and time again, you can graze them down to the dirt and they will come back for more. Everything else that doesn't respond to that kind of grazing uh, or responds adversely to that kind of grazing disappears at an equation. And when you lose all those possibilities, those, those nutritional possibilities, um, guess what? You're going to lose the nutrition in your cattle because they can't even listen to their palate to listen to what they should be eating. So, you know, like Fred uh, Provenza brought up an example of all these medicinal plants. He's like, Glenn, now you have all these medicinal plants in your pastures. You have, you know, stuff like yarrow, you have stuff like plantain. They have a ton of medicinal compounds in them. So, you know, I, I was actually having a cup of coffee with him a while back and I said, Fred, my cattle don't get sick anymore. You know, now um, I'm under 1% of our cattle per year even get sick. And I'm under half a percent that die. And those numbers are unheard of in the cattle industry. They're much higher for other producers. And I was like, well, why aren't my cattle getting sick? And he asked me, he said, Glenn, what are your plant, what's your plant diversity look like now, as opposed to what it looked like 15, 20 years ago. And it's remarkably different. And when we do that, we're offering this vast salad bar of plant diversity for our animals to choose from. And as a result, they can kind of regulate their own wellness by what they choose. So not only do they not get sick, but they gain weight better, they live longer, um, they put on fat better, um, their efficiencies are, are way higher. And they don't, you know, to, to me, even their stress level is lower because they're not seeking different foods. They're all out there, their palate needs are met and their wellness is met. I mean, Glenn, did you said you guys spend years in the Midwest looking at the, you know, the, the seas of, sea of soybeans and corn crops. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the, one of the thoughts, you know, one of the people, some of the people that are critical of animal agriculture, could you, could you turn the, pa the, the, the pasture or the places you're, you're, uh, uh, raising the cattle right now into productive crop production right now is that is that a possibility where you are you know we're pretty high altitude but there's definitely crops you could grow i have some neighbors who grow wheat uh, some that grow potatoes um very very highly chemical uh requiring uh paradigms um and they're they're you know sean i mean i'll just say it their their soils are dead I, I went on one of my farmers, one of my adjacent farmers, uh, grains field, grain fields. He's, uh, he's about a mile away from me down the valley. And uh, I had a filmmaker here on the, uh, on the ranch. And they said to me, so I, I would like to see something on the same soil series that is actually deteriorated. And I said, well, I got something just down the road. So I gave my neighbor a phone call and I said, hey, I got a guy with a camera here. Uh, filmmaker, do you mind if we take a walk out on that grain field you just put in? And he said, no, man, go for it. So we went out there and this is right after we did some soil testing and dug some holes on our place. And uh, the camera guy almost dropped the camera because it was such a staggering difference about the life in that soil. I mean, it wasn't a matter of saying, oh, we're going to send the soil test off and, you know, we're going to try this and see what the organic meant. No, it wasn't any of that. You could just actually see it, Sean, because when I picked up a handful of his soil and I can't even call it soil, it, it, it was dirt. You know, I just held it up in my hand and, you know, cracked the bottom of my palms open and it just sifted out. And there was a wind blowing and a lot of it just blew away. I said, there is absolutely no organic matter in this soil. And he said, well, th this has been row crop for a long time. I said, absolutely not. I said, this was beautiful, diverse plant sod back in May before he took the plow to it and converted it into a grain crop. So in just one fell swoop, he just absolutely re removed all the biological diversity, all the carbon, released all the carbon with just a few passes with a plow and a few passes with a disc and put it in a wheat crop instead of the diverse pasture. So, I mean, we could certainly do that, Sean, you know, but the thing is we're going to lose so much 
of what we've gained. It's un, it's act, absolutely unthinkable for me because we have built a soil biota that probably reaches down six feet into the soil and, you know, two meters deep. We've sequestered an incredible amount of carbon. We've done a carbon equation in our place, you know, adding everything, you know, uh, we took the high amount for cow belching, you know, methane generation and emissions by cattle. We took the high amount for um, petroleum values, you know, using diesel fuel on what little we use a tractor or a diesel pickup. We put all those things in there. We even put the plastic in our packaging and we found out that, you know, it was a huge Excel spreadsheet. And I had a few university guys look it over, some PhDs who specialize in this kind of stuff. And um, we came out with, for every one pound of beef we produce, we put four pounds of carbon in the ground. So for every one pound brick of ground beef we produce, we're putting four pounds of carbon in the ground. And that's absolutely unthinkable on a corn and soybean ranch. I've been on those places and, um, you know, I've run my hand through the ground after we're done in a bean field, after we've combined it. And sure, there's a little bit of trash on the ground from the dried up soybean plants, but essentially that soil is just like my neighbor's was. It's, it's dead. So, you know, from a, you know, as an ecologist, because <laughs> really that's what, that's what we all need to be in agriculture. We, we need to be ecologically minded. We need to think of the whole connectivity from everything from the bacteria in the soil, from the fungi in the soil, from the protozoa that's crawling around in the soil to the earthworms, to our bovine component that walks on it. We share our, our ground with a lot of elk and deer and mountain lions and wolves. Um, they're, they're efficient ecosystem users of the ecosystem we've built and to me, it's actually unthinkable to go back into a row crop agriculture um, because we'd lose all that. We'd lose all those relationships. We lose all that connectivity. We'd lose all that carbon. We could lose all the carbon we put in the ground in just two months by farming it and turning it into a row crop operation. Yeah, I mean, as a consumer, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think that stuff is awesome. It's great. Uh, but at the end of the day, I better be eating a steak I like, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, yep. that's, I mean, that's just a reality. Of it. And, exactly. and so talk to me about, you know, you said, talk to me about, you know, you said you're, you're, you're profitable, your production yield, you know, your weight gain is, is, is pretty high. And in fact, you know, when we compare the commodity beef market where it's going to be, you know, you, you, you run your, your calf with your mama for six months and then you ship it off to a feedlot to, to let them fatten it up for another six months. How do you, what do those numbers look like as far as weight gain and, and that type of stuff? And, and why are so many people still engaged in that system? And then compare that to, to your numbers. Um, and, I, and I know I've got Phil in here commenting on, on your beef. He, he, he's one of your customers and I know he likes it quite a bit, uh, uh, you know, so <laughs> how do you, how do you make, cause I mean, a lot of people criticize grass fed beef. They say, Hey, it's, yeah. it's, it's chewy. It's dry. It doesn't have much, it, it doesn't have any marbling. How do you get around that? Well, there's no workaround, Sean, because it's true. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'd be BSing if I said, oh, yeah, all grass-fed beef is just 100% awesome, beautiful. Uh, the fact of the matter is most grass-fed beef is not. It's a bad experience. So I don't blame people who say, dang, I'd have way rather eat some grain-fed beef than grass-fed beef. Because you know what? If it came down to a taste test, I would too. You know, and I... For us, that's a huge attribute to make it, you know, um, you know, when, when it happened, it kind of started rolling in our mind when we became organic, you know, because if somebody's going to pay for that additional value of organic, it better dang well be better. I mean, better to our taste buds, better to our chew, better to our palate than um, the commodity beef in the next case. It, you know, you basically have entered a contract of trust with that consumer when you get that organic brand, because dang right, it ought to be better. You know, if you're, if you're practicing regeneratively, you better dang right be better. If you're not, you're doing something wrong. So there's people who are early adopters, you know, who just, you know, picked up their place. They're just like we were, you know, 15, 20 years ago, our place was deteriorated. It was just very difficult to make that you know, turn the crank as far as efficiencies and as far as providing excellent food. So granted, there's, there's time involved. There's time and, um, you know, skills, skill sets that you got to learn. And, and you just need time for that soil to kind of reestablish. So 
you know, with regard to your question, as far as, you know, the, the naysayers who would say, well, regenerative or grass fed production is absolutely unthinkable, you know, in terms of, you know, com comparison to a feedlot paradigm, you know, I guess I would say, hey, you know, it is a tough conversion. It's, it's, it's a tough road to get there because it's going to take 10 to 15 years to get there. But when you do get there, you're going to start seeing astounding things happen, happen with the simple aspect of what grass can do when it's on super healthy soil. So, you know, when we started this, Sean, our weight gains, it, we'd be hard pressed to get two pounds a day on our cattle in a feedlot um, with an average frame size, you can get um, 3.5 to four pounds a day. And we're having trouble getting two on grass. And it's like, holy smokes, what's going on here? And we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know that um, that soil diversity and that plant diversity on top uh, would contribute to that soil biodiversity below. And you get a nutritional density when you had those two things getting built, but it took years to get there. And when we finally did get there, now, you know, when we assay our cattle and do weight checks on them, we're getting three pounds. You know, we've had cattle get four pounds a day just on grass, just on our excellent grass pastures. And so, you know, the business is about, hey, you know, you really need these high energy diets to get these cattle to gain weight efficiently. Well, you know, sure, you know, in terms of efficiencies, um, but not economic efficiencies. In terms of feed conversion as efficiencies, yes, you bet all day long, you can get those cattle to gain weight. But as far as economics, if you truly put the whole economic equation in, um, you know, we boiled it down to something very simple, regenerated grass, regenerated soils, and I actually believe regenerated cattle. So it's a very simple thing. We have cattle, we have grass, we impose management on them that ensures that both are going to continue to do well. And it's, so now it's a very simple paradigm. We've taken all the iron out of the production system, iron meaning farm equipment and diesel fuel, um, you know, that's required of you know, crop management scenarios like corn feeding and soybean feeding of hogs and those kind of things. There's a ton of petroleum use and a ton of technology involved in growing those things. So I would submit to you that, you know, in the long run, this way is way cheaper in terms of, of an economic sense. And in terms of scalability, you know, I just look at some real simple numbers of you know, where the bison <laughs> lived in the Midwest, you know, so there was anywhere between 30 and 80 million head of bison in about nine states, you know, and they're providing a crop of bison every year. Um, you know, if we were to, you know, harvest them in a natural setting, you know, we could probably harvest 30 to 40 million head of bison a year. Do you know what the annual kill is for beef in the United States? This is the entire United States. This is including Hawaii. Um, this is every state in the union raising cattle. And I'm just talking about nine prairie states used to provide about the equivalent of 30 million calves a year. You know, and right now our consumption um, nationwide is around only 27 million head. It's actually less than what the bison produce on nine states. So we're producing less cattle on 50 states than the bison were in nine. So I would submit to you and your listeners that you know, really, we have an economic crisis, and I'm not only talking money, it's the economics of, you know, how we use our soils, how we use our petroleum, how we use that iron, how we use the human capital that has created this juggernaut, of, you know, this feedlot paradigm. And um, yeah, it's all in place, and it's easy to slide into that paradigm because it's all in place. But if you were to talk to somebody around 1850 and say, hey, you know what we need in this country is this paradigm with all this technology and all this layering of enterprise, you know, that defines the corn production model today, they'd think you're being ludicrous when, when they look in their backyard and they got some cattle on grass. You know, it, it's so simple for them. And we've created this, you know, undue complexity that is actually the bane of soils. It's the bane of carbon. Um, you know, we're releasing more carbon than ever with this kind of agricultural paradigm. And we're just robbing our soils of nutrition and we're robbing our food of nutrition as well, because the nutrition density and the foods produced in those monocultures 
is not even close to what we can do when we allow an animal to exercise, you know, balancing its own palate and its own wellness. And that was probably more than you want to hear, Sean. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, I'm, I love hearing anything you have to say there, Glenn. But let me, uh, you know, I'm just, I want to, there's a couple of questions in here. Stephen uh, Swick has, has got a, some specific questions, which I yeah. don't know how to answer. But, um, you know, I, my assumption, you know, I mean, when, when we're looking at just macronutrients for cattle, and you know this better than I do, but protein is not where you're going to get your fat from. You're going to get it from the carbohydrate finishing. Yeah. That's where the grain finishing comes yeah. in. And so how does, you know, and I, and I know some of the plants that your cows eat are actually fairly high energy. I mean, you've mentioned it before. They have, you know, they, they're, they're, they're relative, even though they're not grain, they're still relatively high energy. How did you, how do you, because, and you want to finish out these cattle, with the fat marbleizing in there. So how do, is there a way to, is that direct or do they just naturally do it themselves? Or do you kind of say, hey, don't you go gnaw on these high energy plants for a while? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, in the grass fed world, um, there's a lot of nuance in creating a pasture system that is gonna carry quite a bit of carbohydrate on top of the ground. It's pretty easy to get carbohydrate below the ground. There's a lot of our plants that if you taste their roots, you know, you can use a refractometer and actually assay the bricks amount there. But what I do is I just put it on my tongue and chew it up and see how sweet that is. Because, you know, we're super perceptive as humans, especially after I got on the carnivore diet. Uh, I found that my taste buds were kind of getting razor sharpened about, you know, determining, you know, the, the presence of some kind of carbohydrate or starch or sugar. So anyway, I just do that, you know, I'll just dig those things up and, or um, pull those plants off the ground and I'll be able to know what the relative sugar composition is of those plants out there. But here's the other part of it. The cow knows too. And I think the cow knows better than we do. I think their palate um, identifies those plants far better than we do. You know, I see them up on the range. We take them on the range for about three months a year. And up there, there's even more plants. There's 550 grazable species. There's 2,500 plants that are um, up there. Of those, 550 are grazable by our cattle. And I actually pick up a few new <laughs> grazable species every year because I'll be on the back of a saddle horse and I'll be watching a cow eat it. And I'm like, that's not on our list of grazables, but yet they're grazing it. And um, so what they're doing is they're doing two things. One is they're actually evaluating. I think they go out and experiment and say, I'm gonna try that, see what that's like. Uh, number two is they go back um, on the consistent performers for them. So the consistent performers are the ones with sugar and, um, or some carbs, you know, I'll actually be able to see those animals select for those very efficiently and very directly and very intentionally. Um, you know, I, I see it on my horse a lot of times. I'll be on horseback. I'll be trotting across this uh, broken volcanic soil slope. And all of a sudden, the mare I'm on, she's, she knows she's not supposed to do this, but she'll take a bite of a grass on the move. And to us, to a human, this grass doesn't look like much, you know, for instance, this one that I'm thinking of right now in my mind's eye is called Indian rice grass. But when you get off your horse and you grab one of those tiny, tiny, tiny little seeds, these seeds, Sean, are like less than a millimeter long. Um, boy, they are so sweet. They're so sweet. And yet you have this 1300 pound mare who says, I am going to stop for that seed that's less than a millimeter in size because I see carbohydrates and cows are the same way. They see they're carbohydrate seekers. So if you provide it for them, they will get it. So the problem is the vexing problem in, in grass fed agriculture, especially is to get to that point where you have enough of that and you don't allow them to overgraze all the preferable carbohydrate plants right out of the system. Because if you repeatedly graze these things, they disappear out of the system and you're going to end up with non-carbohydrate plants, and then you'll end up with low performance, then you'll end up with poor weight gains, then you'll end up with health issues, okay? Because they're just not able to get the energy. It's just like you talked about, they're energy seekers. So for us as a rancher, my job, my number one job I'm realizing now is to provide them with a diverse offering as possible 
kind of reflectant of what it was in the natural ecosystem before before we showed up. And when we do that, we're going to win because those cattle now have the choice and they have the ability to maximize their own weight gain. So it's not something that we say, oh my gosh, we got to get them on that orchard grass right now. Orchard grass is like probably our highest sugar yielding grass on our irrigated pastures at home. No, we don't think that way. We just think, hey, let's make sure there's orchard grass in all of our paddocks. And we create a grazing paradigm that will enhance even those sugary species. So that's that's the trick. That's the real challenge um, that I submit to many people who raise grass-fed beef and many people who graze cattle is like, how can you manage your pastures to basically emulate what nature did before us with bison or wild herds of elk so that those plants all had you know, a great existence out there, a great number of existence so that those animals could do well. There's a, and I don't, again, this is another question for Stephen. I have no idea even what this is, but he's asking about a BRICS level, B-R-I-X yes. of plants. Yeah. yeah. That, so, what is that? I don't know what that is. So that's, that's just a, uh, it's a numeric value that basically tells you what the carbohydrate complexity is in grass. It's actually the, the solute concentration in um, grass. So what you do is you crush this thing in this thing called a refractometer. Um, it's got a little prism in it. You put that up against the sunlight and it, you'll be able to read on a scale what the amount of uh, solute concentration is in the exudate from the crushing of that, uh, you know, in the refractometer tool. So, you know, it's become this kind of metric for determining the amount of carbohydrate present in plants. And as a result, it can be then converted into what your potential is for weight gains on a given pasture and the performance of the cattle that result from that. So it's a really nice tool. I don't even own one, Sean, because I just go out there and taste it. You know, if I see them eating that grass, I'll just stick it in my mouth and chew on it and I'll see what happens, you know, and I, I can just pick up even, you know, minute amounts of sugar. What's interesting is I, I, I get all these interns um, that ride for us horseback during the summer. This year I had 11 of them. They're from all over the United States. And these are young people. Um, I've had older people, Sean, like um, our age and older come out. And it's pretty much an epic failure because they're just not tough enough. Um, so these young people are resilient enough to ride 18 hours a day, sleep on the ground and do it for five days straight. But anyway, you know, so most of these kids, a lot of them, you know, and I say kids, they're between 18 and 24 years old, most of them, come, they come right out of the junk food culture, you know, and, and they're even bringing that stuff up in their saddlebags. We, we try to convert <laughs> into something that's going to create more resilience in them so they're not going to just fade away like a wilted flower after a week up there. But um, so initially, though, they're, they're eating just crap. You know, they're bringing Twizzlers up and Twinkies and then, then they find out that their Twinkies can't hold up in a saddlebag. They turn into Twinkie pancakes. And um, but they're eating this junk, Sean, you know, so they'll see me get off a horse and try one of these grasses. And I'm like, wow, this thing is really rocky. You know, as far as carbohydrate content, there's a lot of starch here, but there's also a lot of just simple sugars. There's, you know, sucrose, fructose that I'm picking up with my tongue. And uh, they taste it, and guess what? They taste nothing. I mean, they taste. I mean, it's a zero, Sean. They're, they're tasting nothing, and it's because their palate is so screwed up by crap food that they can't even make the assay happen. So, for those guys, in order for them to determine what the you know carbohydrate solute concentration is, they got to use the refractometer. Because they got no ability left in their own taste buds to pick it up. You know, it's not, it's not like I'm a super taster or anything. You know, my kids, they're semi they're carnivore as well. Um, and they could pick it up. They could pick up those subtle tastes, you know, and, and sugar assays. And that stuff is actually really valuable information for us. Because like up on the range, um, that's, you know, it's an ephemeral grassland. So it doesn't get a lot of water late in the summer. So then you really, really have to actually gauge how much weight gain possibility you have on a given mountainside up there in the middle of 70 square miles of nowhere, Bill. And if you can't taste carbohydrates or sugar on this entire mountainside evaluating maybe 25 grass species, 
you better get out of there with your cattle because you're just wasting time. You're just gathering cellulose and lignin and you're not going to gain weight on it. So, um, you know, that that's one of our husbandry issues up there is that we need to continually focus on, you know, mountainsides, you know, uh, plant communities and the time of year and the kind of year we had, you know, this year was a, a wonderful exception because it was super, super dry. It was the driest year we've had in 121 years in this county. And it was it was quite a hack to keep those cattle gaining weight and doing very well. And it required actually determining what the sugar content was of these plants. So that's what BRICS is. BRICS is basically a met metric of, you know, how much carbohydrate, how much energy can we get into these cattle with this given plant? What, um, as far as, um, you know, you know, you talked about the buffalo or the bison, and we had, you know, up to 90 million of them roaming the plains. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, these, you know, you'd hear about, you know, a herd would go by and it would take four days for the herd to pass because there was <laughs> 6 million, you know, animals yeah. in the herd. And, you know, these things are, you know, thought, and they thought that these animals moved due to, predation and that's some of the thought by which uh, some of these regenerative principles are, are, are outlined or are, are overlaid on. Do you, and I know you do a lot of horseback work and, and it may be the terrain is the only way you can do it is because of the terrain you have to use horseback, but do you go out of your way to um, move these animals you know, every day like some of the ranchers do or, or do you do it a little bit differently up there? Because I guess there's different ways to manage animals. What's, what's, how, how do you get these animals to, to keep the soil you know, and, and not just sit in one spot and overgraze one area? Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question because that, you know, one third of the United States land area is dry grazing land. You know, a lot of people don't really have a hand on that number, but it's true. You know, when you get onto the Great Plains and you can't grow grain anymore, um, you know, you're looking at grassland and that goes all the way uh, west to the coastal um, hills of California, you know, it's all grassland. So there's just so much grassland and sagebrush range in our nation. So we need to, you know, consider that, you know, <laughs> what, what the word was on that land, you know, in the 1900s, in the early 1900s was it was wasteland because you couldn't grow crop on it. And what we see it as is this secret treasure because of the plant diversity that you can harvest with uh, animals up there, with grazing animals. But there's a problem associated with it. And you kind of touched on it in, in the paradigm that most people are in, in terms of grazing those wide open spaces. They just turn their cattle out and then they go find them. Um, late in the year when it's time to bring them home or when the grass is gone, they'll move them to a new piece. So basically they allow the cows to just uh, manage themselves. So guess what? There's no wolves, there's no grizzly bears of any you know huge numbers in most of the Western ranges. Um, so there's no agent that's gonna move those animals. There's nothing that's gonna keep them continually, continually moving. And um, you know, as a result, that continual moving actually um, was the hope for a lot of these forage plants, because if you keep grazing them year after year, you're basically going to just kill them. You know, continuous grazing is the bane of the entire dry grassland area of America. And, um, and unfortunately, we've been in it now for about 100 years. So most of these ranges are very degraded because they've lost their plant diversity and they've lost a lot of their plant cover. So for us to want to use those rangelands and want to harvest that wellness up there and see it show up in our beef there's an incredible amount of plant chemicals up there phytochemicals that are inherent you know in those plants those wild plants on these native soils that we could bring to the table literally for our customers and bring to their wellness as well but in order for us to do that with a clear conscience we want to manage that ecologically up there and for us to do that we realize that um the way it was run before we came along was uh, there's indigenous peoples who hunted them. There was indigenous peoples who lit fires. There was lightning caused fires. There was a lot of wolves. I mean, a lot of wolves 
there was a lot of grizzly bears. There was a lot of mountain lions. So you had those three top of the food chain predators, four of them, including the indigenous peoples, always moving these animals around. So as a result, you know, on a given hillside up there on those ranges, I keep looking out the window because I can see them from here. Um, you know, maybe the frequency of grazing was somewhere like one visit for grazing every two to five years. So when Carol and I kind of put that together in our heads, what the history of that country was, we realized, hey, in order for us to regenerate these continuously grazed rangelands, we need to really embrace that same kind of paradigm. And the way we do it is we actually move our cattle all the time on horseback, and we have little border colleague dogs that we move them with too. So our cattle are always moving. They, they except when they're chewing cud and it's time to lay down in the middle of the day, you know, it'll be a beautiful sunny day up there, 70 degrees, their bellies are full. They've had water two or three times a day. We'll stop at a stock tank somewhere that we fill up there. And, and then we'll take them on a journey for the afternoon to have them graze. So every day they walk about um, anywhere between 2.5 and three miles actually walking on a grazing journey where they're taking a bite, taking a step, taking a bite, taking a step. So we'll actually GPS the entire movement of those cattle because we got a GPS with, uh, with us all the time. And we'll be able to document on Google Earth exactly where those cattle were over the 70 square miles of range on a given year. So what we're shooting for right now in the low country, which is the most brittle, tough, low rainfall type of country, we're shooting for one grazing event every 2.5 years. And we're pretty much nailing that on the head right now. So we'll visit a given square meter of ground. And I've timed this, I've sat there with a stopwatch actually measuring on a square meter of ground, we'll be on there for one to two minutes out of 2.5 years. And that's what we're looking at in order to, to run these native rangelands regeneratively. And it's not that far off to run the highly watered grazing lands as well. These are the lands back east. These are the lands in Europe. We have, you know, um, those kind of pastures on our irrigated ground. So it's the same philosophy, but our visitation rights now are you know on a rotation of like 40 to 50 days instead of 2.5 years so it all depends on the amount of rainfall and what the ecosystem you know was before we came along we try to come up with those metrics and then we apply them to how we manage the cattle we have a rain belt up about 8,000 feet that we take our cattle to you know we'll have 450 head in one herd there it's only you know it's the same amount of duration square meters about one to two minutes but it's like every year we'll come back to that same area and we're able to graze that again and we get good results and the plant diversity is improving. So you're right. I mean, there's, it's not about just turning the cattle out because the bison weren't just turned it out, it turned out, you know, you seen, you talk about the railroad train, you know, stopping somebody for four days with 6 million head or whatever, you know, they weren't seeing bison continuously. I just read this old trapper account from 1824. They, he was looking forward to seeing bison. He he did not see them on his way across the Great Plains until I think it was like day 25. They ran into a massive herd of bison. These animals, these bison traveled in groups as did elk, as did uh, pronghorn. They all traveled in these groups where they found success in terms of protection from predators and whatnot. And, you know, they were able to move efficiently and they're grazed very efficiently. So what I'm saying is that we need to mimic that stuff because that is the paradigm that all of these grasses had evolved under. So why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we want to emulate that? Because everything else is going to result to degradation of that resource. Yeah, there's a couple of questions here, Glenn, just if you don't mind about um, <laughs> parasites and dung beetles and, uh, is that something that you have to manage or deal with, or can you see the, the results of that? I mean, are the, you know, obviously if the, if the plant population is diverse, assuming the manure is being managed as yeah. it's supposed to be. How do you, how do you track that stuff? So the parasites, um, we've stopped worming, you know, when we became organic, this was back in 05, and we had some problems initially. Um, we'd see worm counts in our manure and stuff like that. And now, 
And I think it's just because of the paradigm that I just talked about, we're removing any of these animals. We just have zero. We even run sheep and we don't have parasites, which is unheard of. Most people who have sheep have major problems with parasites. Sheep are super parasite prone. But I would submit to you that the parasite prone issues are because we're not moving our sheep. You know, it's just it's just how sheep are made and how the grass underfoot is made. It's the parasite life cycle, you know, whether it be flies to larva that you're picking up as part of the life cycle in your par parasitology. Um, so if you just break that by moving your animals and getting off that for a period of time, you know, for our um, irrigated pastures, that's 30 to 40 days. We break those life cycles. Those flies erupt. They hatch out. They're gone because the cattle aren't even there. The fly life cycle is way shorter than our rotational life cycle with the cattle on the grass. So as a result, we break those life cycles and we stop having any um, parasitism in our cattle. So we don't use ivermectin. We don't use any sort of, you know, wormers or fly controls on our cattle. In fact, I had a visitor up with us on the range this summer and he was a cattle guy. He knew about cattle. We were up there. We had about 400 head of yearlings around us. These yearlings that we run for beef up there, they get very, they're weighing between 800 and 1,000 pounds, a lot of them. They get very tame because they're so used to us herding. Okay, so we're just standing on a horseback there. And I say, what do you notice about these cattle? And the first thing he said was, I can't find a fly. And it was just an absolutely foreign concept to him that these cattle would not have flies on them. Because for him, it was like, if you have cattle, you have flies. And he's up there in this natural system, you know, that we're trying to emulate and replicate. And he can't find a fly and he backs these cattle. And I actually had to find some for him. So he'd be happy. You know, there's some cows with like five flies on them. Or, but it's common, you know, in a, you know, conventional system where people aren't moving their cattle, it's common to see 1,000 flies on the back of a, of a given animal, very common, you know, in, in a non-managed grazing system. So anyway, par parasites pretty much have fallen out the window for us. We've, um, we've taken away their ability to continue a life cycle associated with our cattle. So, and then, um, what was the other part of it? There was, Bring me back, Sean. No, I think, I think that was, that was, uh, you know, you talked about, you know, parasites and, 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 dewormers and flies and so oh, no it was about the, the dung beetles, beetles dung. Yeah. yeah so the dung beetles are good so what's really cool about the dung beetles is we just started picking them up so we nicole masters she's a, a soil agroecologist who spent a bunch of time with us on horseback up there last year so she pulls she, the gal has got chutzpah because i mean she can pull a pile of crap off the ground and start pulling it apart and start pulling all these, you know, dung beetles out of it. And I didn't even know I had these things, Sean. So um, she finds five or six different species up on her range of dung beetle that I didn't even know we had. So that's super exciting. At home, now when you pull up a, a manure pat, especially in the springtime, um, you can pull that thing apart and you're gonna come up with like at least 10 dung beetles in a given manure pile, some a lot more, some less. But what's really cool, this is the coolest thing, is um, we rented another place and we certified organic because this gal hadn't sprayed anything on it. But her brother had run cattle on it this spring. And so guess what? All this manure is still there. It's still unbroken down. It's scattered on the place in July. So me and Jeremiah, he's uh, one of my long ranch employees. I said, dude, we got to pull apart some of these manure pads and see what's inside them. And guess what? We can't find a living thing in them. There's not one living organism in this guy's manure pads that he grazed on just three months before we were there. And for us to have a manure pad last on our place for three months, there is something dead wrong because they're usually gone in, in a week. You know, you'll have a manure pile, you know, it'll be layered like a pie. And that'll be broken down and completely deteriorated in like a week by these dung beetles and these different manure flies and all this stuff. So what's really cool <laughs> is that we go over there and we find these manure pads are totally intact. And so Jeremiah says, what's going on? Where's the dung beetles? 
And I'll tell you where the dung beetles are. The dung beetles aren't there. And it's because of his worming program has actually put chemical in his manure pads that have repulsed any colonization by any type of any type of insect, you know, whether it be dung beetle, dung beetles or manure flies, we have these little green manure flies that lay eggs in there. They hatch out, the manure pat explodes, dung beetles come in, they carry a whole bunch of that material underground. It's not happening on his place because his former tenant, his cows had enough chemical in their system that it showed up in the manure that then Hopefully it wasn't an insecticide, but at least it was a repellent toward those kind of organisms to break down the manure. So what that means for us is we're not going to get the value of that manure into our soil. You know, we always say, oh, we got to get this manure on the ground. You know, we got to take it out of the feedlot and spread it on the ground. But I would submit to you that the value of that manure is way, 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 way less because of the chemical existence. You know those compounds still pre still exist they're still like persistent in those manure piles that you see in these places so, so i'm wondering you know when we see people use steer manure you know in their gardens and whatnot it's like well what are you doing here you know sure you, you're going to provide some carbon you're going to provide some um you know organic matter to the soil and sure you're going to have better cation exchange potential but what about the fungi? What about the bacteria? What about the arthropods? What about the protozoa that you want in your garden soil to partner with your garden plants? Are you gonna extirpate them by just applying steer manure from, from Walmart on your garden? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. I don't know if anybody does. And uh, Charlie says it'll still make fuel for a fire. So yeah. <laughs> I guess you can burn it, but you ain't going to improve your soils with it because it's never going to get in the soil. Hey, Glenn, have you seen uh, a recovery of wildlife? I mean, in the, in, the, in the area you've had since you've been grazing in this way, have you seen a difference in birds, bees, deer, you know, whatever? Yeah, so, you know, the birds, bees, deer, um, deer, I would say, you know, I, I would like to say, oh, yeah, Sean, of course, you know. But so there's, there's, there's certain things we call keystone species that basically, you know, just like keystone on an arch, you know, holds up that whole arch, that top angled piece of rock up there in that arch holds up the whole arch. And it turns out it's the most important rock for the entire arch. We find that there's species out there that now have recolonized our wild rangelands because of our grazing management. And we call those keystone species because entire portions of ecosystems get reconstructed when they show up. And the, <laughs> our favorite one right now is the beavers. So when we when we moved on to this um, grazing land here, it's 70 square miles. We call it the Hat Creek Range. And it uh, ranges from uh, 4,000 feet elevation all the way up to 10,000 feet. So it's super, super diverse. There's 55 miles of perennial creeks up there. Sean. So a lot of those creeks have fish in them. So <laughs> when we got that, um, a lot of these creeks were uh, virtually unvegetated um, by brushy species. A lot of the native plants were gone. They were just uh, ephemeral culverts, carriers of water, you know, across a, a dry range landscape. So you'd see when I say that, you know, just drawing a picture of it, is you'd see just this ribbon of water with maybe a little bit of green with non-native vegetation along it. Most of the brush would be gone. Uh, most of the willows, most of the aspen, you know, pretty much wiped out or senescent, or, you know, they would be non-reproductive. Um, so you'd see this rocky kind of ribbon of water. And a lot of times, you know, during the driest part of the year in August, that would become ephemeral. So that, that water would go underground. It wouldn't even be on the surface anymore. So when we change our grazing, you know, to emulate bison, emulate herds of elk, um, the first thing that, you know, ec ecological Carol and Glenn, you know, really wanted to try to fix was this riparian question. You know, that riparian is all the life, all the species that are associated with these wet areas, this 55 miles of Ribbon Creek up there on the Hat Creek Range. So the best way to do that was just get the cows off. Because here's the deal, you know, when, when we turn cows out 
especially in these broken ranges with a lot of topography, they behave badly. Cows behave badly and they behave badly because they will follow the siren song of two things, um, the color green and gravity. So guess what? Later in the season, um, big cow will just lumber on down a hillside. They won't want to go up. It's hot out. They will go downhill. And guess what's at the bottom of the hill? It's a creek. It's a creek. And it has green grass still alongside of it, even in the dry part of the year. That cow and her calf will stay there all the way until the rancher goes to find them. This is ubiquitous across the entire West. This is happening everywhere. This is from California all the way to the eastern slope of Colorado. This same phenomena happens across the entire West. And this is why we there's a lot of people who are totally against grazing in the West. And it's because we let these cows behave badly. So they'll go down, they'll fall down, you know, into these creek bottoms. They will annihilate all the native vegetation. And it's through what I talked about in a previous little sound bite, you know, on this on this cast with you, Sean, where continuous grazing is what's ruining a lot of this native vegetation. And indeed, they not only ruined the graminoids, the grass species, but also took down a lot of the woody species as well, the willows, the um, the aspens the cottonwoods, the alders, all these woody species are key components to a healthy riparian ecosystem. So anyway, long story, making it real short and compacting it. By changing our grazing, we started, we changed from using 35 miles of creek to where we could find cattle impacts to 300 meters of creek where we'd either cross a creek or get a drink at it. The aggregate of all the creek distance we had our cattle exposed to for about five years straight was 300 meters. So what happened was that the woodies and the native species all started to recolonize with a vengeance. And after year five, we had no beavers before year five, before year zero. And after year five, we started to pick up all these beavers. So this is a sagebrush ecosystem, Sean. These beavers ha ha actually had to walk like many miles. And I don't know who told them. I don't know if they do like, you know, so I've read some articles about how they actually send out scouting missions for new habitat, where an older patriarch beaver will travel for miles trying to find habitat. So I don't know what the mechanism is, but they start showing up. Okay, and they start showing up one out. These are, you know, big rodents. They're like, you know, this size. This is a small beaver. I've seen beavers, you know, um, almost a meter long from tail to nose, you know, just huge animals, some of them. But most of them are, you know, just, you know, overgrown rat size. And they are rats, they're rodents, okay? These <laughs> are rats with long teeth and a flat tail. And they can travel at a top speed of about six miles an hour at a run. This is six miles an hour in a run. This is in a world where we have intact wolf populations. We have a lot of wolves up there. They howled at us all summer. We were camped with them. They, they would come in our camps while we're out with the cattle. We'd see these big wolf tracks all over camp. And then we'd come back and we'd camp there. And we actually just ran night patrols pretty hard with our cattle to make sure that we didn't lose anybody. We had no altercations. But anyway, these wolves can run up to 35 miles an hour and they're going to take out a stupid little beaver that's top speeding. <laughs> you know, it's like a marshmallow on legs going six miles an hour. So these guys were super vulnerable just to get to this habitat up Hat Creek that we constructed for them, you know, just by changing our grazing. So now the count right now at the end of this year, 21, I think we're up to 75 beavers up there in Hat Creek. And the amount of recolonization and rehab of streams is just it's now exponential it's just an incredible thing and it's just by changing the grazing and mimicking what nature did before we showed up because before we did continuous grazing there was no continuous grazing there was beavers everywhere you know just in this river valley alone the Pasimari river valley in 1824 there's 30,000 beavers trapped out of this thing so they were nearly extirpated by the Hudson Bay Company and the American Fur Company for guess what hats in Europe for top hats, <laughs> which I, I don't even wear top hats. You know, this is just a, a ball cap shot. <laughs> and I wear a cowboy hat a lot. And that's actually, you know, a lot of cowboy hats are made of beaver fur. But anyway, we just had this fur craze thing going on that almost wiped out beavers in America. And then the cows came along and the cows came along 
and nailed the coffin shut. They just nailed the coffin shut on beavers because even if the beavers came back because people's hat preferences changed, they had they were homeless. They had no home, they had no habitat because continuous grazing wiped it out. So all we had to do was change continuous grazing for just a period of five years. It was no big deal to do. And the beavers started coming back in a storm and we're excited. So with that, you talk about the birds and the bees and the deer, of course they're taking off because what these beavers have done is created these riparian areas that are now three times wider. There's all this woody species coming up. We now have trees that have grown just in that short period of time, five to 10 feet high. And you know, that's, that's avian habitat. That's what they need. They need elevational change for nest protection. And so the birds have descended on these riparian areas because the dang beaver came back and created a home for them. So all we need to do is create a home for beavers. Beavers created a home for all these other species. That's why they're the keystone. But it turns out the crazy thing is, Sean, what I'm realizing is ranchers, operators of cattle can actually be the keystone species because we're holding the keys. We're holding the keys to regeneration. And it just blows me away with the opportunities that we have. You know, if you want to talk about carbon, you know, with the climate change issue, you put a beaver in there, they're going to multiply your carbon a hundred fold because they're going to, you know, triple the size of your creek bottom. They're going to put water in the soil. They're going to create all this vegetation. They're going to create all this root mass. Beavers are the agent of change for carbon, you know, and we can do it as grazers. We hold the keys to regenerating just miles and miles, like literally tens of thousands of miles of creeks in the West are in our charge and we can make the change. And that's exciting stuff. Indeed, that, that, that is. I, I, I didn't know so much about the beaver, so that was interesting to hear. Um, Glenn, I, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the time here, and I, I think we could talk for many, many hours, but tell people where they can go to find out about uh, more what you do. I know you've got an Instagram account, and then just as importantly, if people want to order beef from you, and can you order like a side of beef, or do you sell it? Do you sell it in quarters and halves, or is it 100% boxed? Anyway, let's let, let people know that information. Okay, so um, the best way to connect, um, I got seven daughters, and they're ranging from <laughs> 16 years old all the way up to 27. And, you know, I am like 60 years old, Sean. So guess what? I'm not on social media, <laughs> but they are. So if you guys are into social media at all, just go to Alderspring underscore ranch, Alderspring underscore ranch, and just follow us there on Instagram because they're always providing content there. Some of it's educational content. More often, it's just, hey, we want to hang out with you content. This is what's going on with the ranch. This is what the range riders are up to this week. This is what the cattle are. So it's just a kind of a day-to-day. -day, not, it's not always day-to-day -day because we get busy, but most days they'll put a post or a story on there that kind of brings you into, you know, what our values are and what it's about. It's not, it's not a selling site at all that, you know, we've learned that we don't want to create a culture of customers. We want to create a culture of people who are connecting all the dots, you know, ecologically all the way through from, you know, the, this, this life under the soil we talk about to the animals that walk on it, not only our animals, but elk and wolves and deer. And then, you know, we want to create a connectivity to um, the people who partner with us through that by buying the beef. So it's not, we, we were trying to create a culture there of awareness of this ecological continuum that we're all part of. So that's really what Alder Spring underscore ranch is about. We also have Alder Spring Ranch Facebook. So those are two cool things where you can tell, catch stories all the time. Um, and then of course it's alderspring.com. There's a lot of resources on that. And then there's also a segue from there uh, to the Alder Spring um, store. So um, we'd love to serve you as a customer. Um, and I guarantee you'll like our product. And it's expensive, but everything is these days um, and it's, you know, it's difficult to keep those prices down because, you know what, the bottom line is, you know, in a feedlot paradigm, 
they keep those cattle alive for 16 months and they're basically babies <laughs> by the time they slaughter them. We have to add a whole nother year onto our paradigm because um, it takes longer. It takes longer to craft great beef. So, you know, we're averaging 26. So of course it's gonna cost more. You know, people are like, why does this cost more? You're just on grass. And I'm like, dude, every, every day you have an animal longer costs you money because you run this ranch, you have all these operational costs you know, whether it be taxes or mortgages and all this, all this stuff accrues day after day after day. So of course it's going to be more expensive. We keep it longer, but it's worth it. Anyway, Sean, thank you very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. And I, now that you're in Washington, dude, you have no excuse not to just, but it's a one day drive, man. It's a one day drive. You're going to get tired of rainfall in the Pacific Northwest. And you're going to say, I need to dry out. I'm going to call Glenn. So you need to get over here. Well, let's do that. I, like maybe maybe over the spring would be nice to get out. Where where exactly in Idaho are you? I don't even know. I'm not sure where all the spring is. So it's right in the middle of Central Mountains. Um, you know, there's the Panhandle, that narrow piece of Idaho on top, and then it gets real wide. Most of the wide is either agricultural land or desert. That's where the taters come from. Then there's this just solid blob of mountains in the middle of the state. And Sean, it is the middle of nowhere. So actually, it's not the middle of nowhere, but you can see it from here. So, <laughs> well, I know my, I know my, uh, my, my, my better half and our kid would love to go check out the ranch. That'd be awesome. So Thanks, we'll, right. we'll try to, yep. We'll, 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 we'll hook up with you and make a, make a plan a trip for it, Glenn. How's let's that? Do it. Let's do it. Let's do, let's All take right. a live, let's take a live podcast on the ground, Sean. Let's yeah, do that. let's do that. That'd be great. Awesome. Be great. Well, I got to run, Glenn. You guys take care, everybody. We'll see you back tomorrow. Thanks so much, Glenn. And I, and I mean it. I'll try to get out there this, this probably this spring. All right. All right. All right. Thanks again, Sean. Take care. Bye, bye, guys. You bet. Join Rivero.Health for a 30-day free trial to get access to live Q&A with VIP guests, social community meetings, member discounts, low-carb healthcare providers list, forum, workouts, monthly challenges, early access to podcasts, recipes, carnivore diet guide, fasting guide, shred guide, and much more. 